Hey there, gang. I've got a lovely little parlor guitar here that needs a bunch of work. This is an oldie. It's from a venerable brand, Lion and Healy, from Chicago. The company was formed in 1864 by a pair of enterprising young gentlemen to be a retail shop for a pretty big music publisher, Oliver Ditson. Guitar fiends will recognize that name because much later on that company would commission Martin to build the first dreadnought-shaped guitars in 1916. It's unclear when exactly Messrs. Lyon and Healy got into building instruments, but by the 1880s they were producing guitars, banjos, mandolins, other more esoteric things like zithers, and they were doing this under several house brand names, the most recognizable of which is Washburn. Washburn is probably better known than Lyon and Healy, actually. They also branched into pianos, organs, brass instruments, and concert harps. They are very well known in the harp world. By the turn of the 20th century, they were one of the biggest instrument distributors in North America. And at that point, they were contracting work out to all kinds of smaller shops and putting their brand name on. So they had other builders working for them, basically. Identifying and dating these can sometimes be a bit of a challenge because the company records were destroyed in a couple of different fires over the years including the Great Fire of Chicago, and there seems to be some crossover and reuse of serial numbers. There just aren't great resources online to look this stuff up, like there are with Gibson or Martin. And because they were also buying production from other makers, sometimes decorative components, um, they can vary, even within the same model built in the same year, because they're put together in different shops. This one is clearly labeled as Lion and Healy. It's not a Washburn. It's about 12 and 7 eighths of an inch wide across the lower bout, which puts it in the Martin sizing scheme somewhere between a size 1 and a size O. It's got a short 24 and 1 quarter inch scale. It's not super fancy, but it has got pretty nice purfling. Um, and yet the fingerboard is not ebony, it's ebonized maple. So this to me seems like a middle of the road model. Maybe a high end student model, or what they would call the ladies model. I think it's turn of the century, probably 1890s to 1915. There's an interesting little artifact inside here. This is a repair label from a violin maker. Repair labels, you sort of see them in the violin world sometimes, usually on older instruments. We kind of eschew them in the guitar business. They're seen as gauche and tooting your own horn, and we just don't do that these days. This is from a different era. Sidney T. Eagle, who was apparently working in Maple Creek, Saskatchewan, in, I'm thinking this is saying December of 1938, and the 45 might be a job number. I can't find any info on him at all. But Maple Creek has a population of 2,000 people today, which for the southwest corner of Saskatchewan is pretty bustling, actually. For those of you in the U.S., this is roughly a six-hour drive north of Billings, Montana. So you see a lot of this on the way there. Oh, and 1938 was absolutely the final year you could get away with having this ancient decorative motif on your label. So what did Mr. Eagle do to this thing? Well, there's no evidence of body cracking, no fancy violin patchwork. He probably re-glued the bridge, because there's some scuff marks around here and evidence that it had come up at a previous point. And I think he may have fitted it with some new bridge pins. Looking at the bridge plate inside, which is really just a wide, low, softwood brace that spans the entire top, there seem to be little plugs fitting into the pinholes, where they've been drilled and reamed to get a decent hold on the pegs. These are quite loose at the top of the bridge, suggesting the originals were probably thicker in section. Wider pins were a thing, but beyond that, I don't see any signs of real trauma. There are some paint specks, which apparently happened a lot back in the day. There seems to be a lot of painting going on with guitars in the room, uncased, for some reason. You see it more often than you'd imagine. The back has a lot of the usual scrapes and scuffs. The finish on this appears to be shellac. Um, how do I know? It just has a certain appearance. It's hard to pick up, but there is a very, very fine kind of cracklure or checking. Little tiny squares that you see in shellac that's very old. And just the quality of the scuffs. You can tell that the finish is very thin. And they just... it looks like shellac. The body is made of mahogany that's been stained a dark brown. And the neck... hard to tell. It feels pretty light. I think it might be a very good quality of poplar. It's 
It's very light in color. It doesn't have much of that greenish cast you often see. It could also be something like a soft maple. Almost looks like alder in certain lights. A little bit of figure in there too, which is very beautiful. You can see it's also got a very um, triangulated neck shape. It's a hard V, which I find quite appealing. Pretty usual headstock shape for the period. Vintage tuners. We're missing a button. The interesting thing to me here is that there are no braces on this guitar besides that big wide bridge pad and the usual transverse ones above and below the sound hole. I measured the thickness of the soundboard at the edge of the hole here and it's a pretty consistent 125 thousandths, one eighth of an inch, just over three millimeters thick. Now that's pretty thick for a gut strung instrument and there's some debate about how these were actually meant to be strung because it was a transitional period. Uh, there are three millimeter thick soundboards in the classical world, but they're kind of rare. Um, Herman Hauser comes to mind, but eh, I don't know. We have to figure this out because it will affect how I move forward, shaping things like the nut or the degree of neck set, etc. You know, it's either a very, very heavily built gut strung instrument or a very lightly braced steel string one with the narrow body, good stiff Adirondack top, and the short scale, we could use an extra light string, steel string, and it'd be just fine. You know, it's probably best to tune down when it's not being played, but I'd say that of almost any of these 120 year old guitars. We could also put on a high tension nylon set. So I've got a call out to the uh, owner. We're going to see what we want to do here. Perfect timing. Just got the email. Leaning towards steel strings. This is also one of those guitars that could be converted to an X-Brace if you really wanted to go through the whole thing and pop the back off and do all of that. Basically rebuild it from the bottom up. I don't think that's what we're going for. For steel string use though, I am considering adding one single transverse brace, a tone bar at the back end here, like you'd find in a Martin with an X-Brace or most usual ladder brace guitars. There's almost always a bar on the back side. So I think that would be a little bit of extra insurance. I think the first issue to address is the bridge. Like many of its brethren, it's cracked off at the front edge. I think it's been glued back and cracked again, maybe several times. The saddle slot is now very misshapen. There are cracks between the pinholes, and it's lifting again at the back end. It's not a great fit against the soundboard, so a reproduction might be in order. The other thing is, there's slightly less than adequate uh, compensation. A little bit of extra past the mathematically perfect string length. It's missing about a millimeter on the treble side, a bit more on the bass, which isn't uncommon for guitars in this era. Most of them don't have enough saddle slant. So I'm heating up the bridge and you can see how much was loose to begin with. Basically all along the back. I'm cutting through a big glob of glue along the front edge. It came free without too much hassle. Just a little bit of wood loss on the bottom there. It might be hard to see, but there is some evidence of plugging, and the ball ends of the strings have pulled right through the bridge pads, so I'll need to redo these. Just heating up the fingerboard extension here. You've got to be careful because this old binding, it's got a crack at the end of every single fret, so eh, just I got to be gentle, that's all. The other thing I've got to watch out for is this fingerboard has a couple of big cracks right down the center. It doesn't really make sense to repair those prior to this because the heat's just going to loosen the glue again. But at the same time, because I'm going to be putting a knife under there, I just got to be aware of the fact that it's not a continuous surface I'm working with. Yep, the tiniest bit of levering and it pops right off. I'm going to remove the 13th fret. Yeah, this one is so low, it's hard to get the fret lifters under it. Hmm. I'm wondering whether this top layer is a veneer. 
makes things even better. So I'll quickly glue back the chips and level it out later. On these earlier guitars, the dovetail is often shorter, maybe 5 sixteenths of an inch or 8 millimeters. So rather than drilling straight down, I'll angle toward the heel very slightly, trying to find the pocket. I'm very much enjoying these uh, heaters. Use them on, oh, I think four neck resets now. That feels like it's just about ready to go. And um, they're very fast, you know, like 10 minutes is not uncommon. Here she comes. I'm alternating between wiggling and putting a little more pressure on the bottom. There we go. A little shim here. And a little shim down there. Okay. I'm looking at the state of this board, the fact that I can see light through it in numerous places. I don't relish the idea of refretting it. It might be better to make a whole new one, preserving the inlays and just putting them in the new board, because it's got so many little cracks in it, and these frets are so low. Hmm. It might actually be quicker in the long run just to make a new board out of ebony, which would be an upgrade. But I'm going to have to sleep on it and see what I think. So I don't like the idea of taking away the original material, but at the same time, that's pretty bad. I'll use a quarter inch plug cutter to make some patches for the blown out bridge pin holes. In the soft chippy spruce, I'll ream the hole until the top edge is just at a quarter of an inch to keep my drill from tearing things out. I enlarge the hole, insert the plug, and I'll pare off the excess. Then I'll do a second set of plugs in front of the first to get rid of more of those gaps. Working on the bridge, this blank has a little knot I want to avoid there. I'll take the important measurements then plane it to thickness. I'll frequently check things with my dial caliper. So I've done some layout. I've uh, planed this to width and thickness and cut it to length. It's interesting, this is proportionally quite a long bridge for a guitar of this size. This is a standard Martin bridge here. And I've drilled pilot holes for the pins I don't go all the way through at this stage because when it comes time to fit the bridge to the body I might want to scrape this bottom surface and if there are holes there uh, the scraper gets hung up in each one and it creates a bunch of little ruts or furrows so it's just easier um, drilling them blind at this point. So at this stage I just have to round over the edges slightly and um, cut the uh, wings using a oscillating spindle sander. Okay, I've carved a brace. It's about a quarter inch wide by just about three eighths of an inch tall. And I'm going to install it here slightly diagonal. Uh, the transverse brace in the upper boat is actually installed diagonally as well, a la Santos Hernandez. But it's um, sort of pushed towards the uh, treble side of the soundboard. And uh, I'll do that on this side as well. Um, reasonably stiff, fairly light spruce. Well, this might be useful. Deep reach clamps are very expensive, and sometimes they just don't fit. So I make these quick and dirty collapsible ones. They're held together with two screws, so I can pivot the top jaw out of the way for insertion. If you've ever tried to do this kind of work eight inches away from the sound hole, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's helpful when you're dealing with guitars with a shallow body depth. I glued the bridge on. The brace that's under there, as I mentioned previously, is softwood, so the ball ends of the strings have made a real mess of it. They've chewed completely through. So I'm going to glue on a little maple overlay to uh, provide a surface for those to bear against. In order to do that, I'm going to have to sand flat that inner surface, because I think it's slightly rounded, and it's got remnants of those plugs that uh, Mr. Eagle put in there. So. Uh, this is one of those times when I wish I had a slightly smaller wrist just to get my hand in there. A 
couple of the plugs are standing too high to really sand down, so I'm going to have to get in there with a cut-off saw and uh, do my best. I'm going to repair this tuner button here. I've also noticed that the post on this one one of the capture rings there is uh, a little loose, so we might have to peen that back into place. You can see this shaft is slightly bent, and this loosening here is something that often happens when someone tries to straighten a shaft by tugging on it. Um, these are just held in place by expanded tabs of brass here. So, yeah, i got to get my little nail set. Try to peen that over. That's much better. To put on the new button, I need to heat up the shaft using my soldering soldering iron and just press that on with the vise. Notice anything interesting? The gears are above the posts. This is the way a lot of them were made prior to the 1920s. It works fine. Um, there are certain mechanical advantages they realized to having the post above the gear. So now virtually all of them are the opposite way. Well, I thought about it and I've decided that with the goal being a guitar that is top notch, very playable, done right, that's what's being asked of me, I have to change the board. It's got these incipient checks throughout it, and, you know, I could spend a lot of time trying to pull it back together and refret it as it is, but it's a losing game. You know, I'm going to get a better result with the new board. The binding, of course, will stay in place at that point. It'll be more stable. I can add a little bit of radius to it, because this thing is dead flat, or actually it's concave in certain areas, um, for more comfortable playing. The radius makes sense. And with that board off, I can sink some reinforcement into the neck and keep things straight for another hundred years. So that's the way I'm going to go. I've got to take some pretty careful measurements. Like this, for instance, I can see the fingerboard itself has shrunk a bit, exposing the edge of the neck in this area. So when I make a new one, I want to make it oversized enough that I can dress the binding down and not have that be a lip or a step there. It's important to consider what the actual shape of the fingerboard is as it meets the neck and comes around to the top. This is fairly straight sided. It rolls around over on the top edge. But it's not like it's heavily modeled into the contour of the neck. So the neck is shaped in one direction and then it sort of abruptly changes up here at the top. After I peeled off the binding, the board basically fell right off. It was very loose. Actually, this board the edges are so dry, I wonder whether they were ever actually glued down. Maybe they were relying on the binding to get that area. Lots of glue down here over the tongue, but it's pretty dry. I've mentioned this in previous videos. We've got another case here of a ladder braced guitar with no sound hole reinforcement on either side. Uh, this is, I think, essential if you're going to put steel strings on a ladder braced guitar. There needs to be some way of mitigating the dipping effect that happens around the hole. There's oftentimes a lot of distortion. Uh, these are about three millimeters thick, so they're not, you know, extremely heavy, but they will um, consolidate the stress in this area between the two braces. So I'm going to glue those in. Cutting fret slots. This shot is going to make you seasick, but something in the camera is magnifying the vibration in the table saw. It's not bucking around this much in real life, I promise. I've got the underside of the board covered in tape, and I've stuck the neck to it with super glue so I can trace the outline. This is important because I can't just make an idealized, straight-sided board and expect it to match perfectly. Slight deviations get introduced when the neck is shaped. And before I remove the board, I drill two holes for positioning pins through a couple of fret slots. So, I can register it back in this exact place going forward. The white tape lets me see the line more easily when band sawing out the board, and I'm going to cut it just outside the pencil line so that I can peel the tape off during the shaping process 
while leaving the line there. Having been through the bandsaw, now I'll plane carefully using my shooting board and a smoothing plane. As I get closer, a shorter plane, the block plane in this case, helps to get into the subtle dips and curves that the longer sole would just skate right over. We're talking thousandths of an inch here, but it's not perfectly straight. So the board is now the right shape, but it's oversized by the width of the binding. So I'll measure that, set a marking gauge to just shy of the full width. This will leave a tiny bit of binding to be scraped back when we're done. And I'll mark that against the edge of the board. Repeat the process and plane down to that line. Here's where the cut tape comes in handy. As I sneak up on it, I can peel it back and I have this really high contrast edge to plane to. It would be hard to see that with just a knife cut, definitely with a pencil line, you'd be too imprecise. With the board pinned in place, I can now test the fit and it's just the way I want it. There's a thin little sliver of excess material to take off on the bottom. It's time to remove these guys. It would be so much easier if it was just the dots. I carved a little ramp around each inlay and soaked them in water for a few minutes to loosen the glue. They popped out reasonably well, except for one diamond which got a little crack. I'll have to be super careful when reinstalling as these have all been sanded quite thin and some of them are slightly irregular in thickness because this board did start off with some radius but I think the ends warped up from the neck because of the lack of glue there so it sort of flattened out over time. I'll be inlaying two bars of six millimeter carbon fiber. It's very stiff relative to its mass and far less bendy than a piece of maple of similar section. To cut slots in the neck I have this router tray. I stick the neck to it using the super glue and tape trick. You can see that there's a dado cut in the bottom to accept the headstock veneer which rises higher than the surface of the neck. And for added insurance I have a couple of padded hold downs that screw into place. I cut to depth in a series of shallow passes. You'd want to use a plunge router for this. A fixed base introduces too much error when you're adjusting the depth. Having turned a bunch of this wood to dust now, I still don't know what it is. It's not one of the usual culprits. It doesn't smell like maple. It's not poplar. It's not birch. It's not even alder. It's slightly skunky. Slightly acrid. Yeah, don't know. I've learned from experience to make the recesses just a hair deep. Um, you don't want the carbon fiber to be proud of the surface when it's done because that's a real nightmare. That's a, that's a bad day trying to sand or scrape this stuff level with the surrounding surface. I use just enough epoxy to coat the bottom of the slots and then some, knowing it will squeeze up around the sides and bond everything well. I don't want too much squeeze out on the surface. I'll use a different kind of glue to put on the fingerboard and that might compromise the bond. This thing gets strapped down to a very flat piece of phenolic countertop using a surgical tubing. I'll dress the fingerboard with a 16 inch radius sanding block. This is the Martin standard, so it should feel familiar to most people. This is a nasty business. Dust is awful. I wear a respirator when I'm doing this. I fix the inlay in position with the tiniest little drop of glue and then scribe around the outline with a scalpel blade. Then I get in there with a dremel and a tiny end mill to excavate. There's always fine tuning to be done after that with a chisel and scalpel. The inlays are glued in and leveled, and then I'll install the frets. I don't often fret boards off the guitar, but it makes sense in this case, as I need them in place to get the right angle for the neck when I'm resetting it. I'll also put in some side dots which the original didn't have, but most people are very happy to see, especially because this is one of those antiques where the fret inlay is at the 10th fret rather than the 9th. That can really screw you up if you're not careful. And the board is ready to be glued on. I used surgical tubing for clamping again. Okay, so that glued up very nicely. It's good and straight. There is that little overhang of binding to take care of. It varies from place to place around the neck because it was not perfectly shaped. It's just a little lip. 
So the goal is to blend that slightly into the curve of the neck wood and have it resolve with the top edge gracefully. The original binding, you remember, was basically rectangular, so we have this V-shape resting up against a rectangle, which, you know, it is what it is. There's only so much blending we can do. Um, people will be freaking out right now about the color. Don't worry. I'll mist it with some slightly tinted lacquer and I'll kill the stark white. It's going to be okay. So I'll use the razor blade as a scraper, then sand it lightly. This is just enough to take out the newness. It's very lightly tinted with amber. I need to get the nut roughed in at this stage because I'll need the string spacing when I'm doing the neck reset. The neck reset progressed as it usually does. There's a gradual tipping of the neck by progressive sanding strokes along each side of the heel. The process takes some time. Here I'm checking the alignment by stretching some string between the nut and the outside bridge pin holes. When the dovetail fits well, it doesn't take a lot of clamping pressure to get things locked together. Here I'm cutting the saddle slot. I went with a 3 32nd of an inch saddle. Some of the older ones were thinner, but I think this will look proportional and do a good job. Then it's time to drill, ream, chamfer, and slot the pin holes. One thing about these vintage bridges with a through saddle is the standard bone blank you buy from every guitar shop supply, it's not going to be long enough. So you have to go out of your way and source something that's extra long. I get these from Luthier's Mercantile, and they're good. They're also very generously proportioned, so there's a lot of sanding to get them into shape. The proper fit is important. Snug is good. Not too snug, where it becomes a wedge that can split the bridge, but it's got to fit right. You run into problems if there's enough wiggle room that it can lean forward against this top edge here. It just gets too much leverage. Traditionally these are glued in, and when I do that, I just do the ends. Um, I stick it to the side wall towards the pin side, because I've spent too many hours excavating these things with a tiny chisel. Um, I don't want a super tall saddle with a whole lot of exposure. This would be ridiculous. Uh, there are times when that works with other guitars, but for this style and this age, I don't want to put too much torque on the top. So that's something I sort of figured in when I was doing the neck reset. I didn't want to overset this one. Let's discuss the alterations necessary to make sure this thing can handle extra light or light steel strings and be around for another hundred years. On the left is the soundboard as it came. This view is as if we were looking through the top from the outside with x-ray vision. See it's very sparsely braced. On the right are the additions. Starting from the top, I added the fingerboard brace. This adds support under the end of the fingerboard and it can also help keep things intact up there if it ever decides to crack. It's comparable to what the bluegrass players call the popsicle stick in a Martin guitar. There are rumors of people who go about removing this brace from old Martins to improve the tone. Most repair people consider that insane. Up next are the sound hole braces. These alleviate the tendency for that part of the top to fold inward. Below that is a diagonal brace that acts like a bridge between the sound hole brace and the bridge. It meets the end of the bridge in the same area and does the same thing the X brace does in a Martin. It resists and spreads the rotational force around. With the slanted sound hole brace, that side of the top should be stiff enough, so I didn't put one on the treble side. On the bridge brace, I added the maple overlay, and then finally at the bottom we have the tone bar, again in essentially the same position you'd find it on a Martin of a period. So now with all this done, I'm confident it's well supported, it's not in danger of collapsing, and we can play it like a regular steel string guitar. Okay, I think I've just about got it. Really the only thing left to do is to plug the previous strap button hole because it's much too big for any of the buttons I have on hand. I put some strings on. These are 8020 bronze 10 to 47s, which uh, 
is a super light set. I'm tempted to go up to 11 to 52s and see what happens. Uh, I think you can probably take it. These are a little bit springy for me. Um, you know, 11s, I'd probably tune down between playing sessions, just to make sure everything's okay. But it seems to be holding up fine. It's not caving in or bulging out yet. I'll let it sit for a few more days just to make sure the settings are all you know, pretty solid on it and nothing is moving. But it's a lovely little guitar. really like it.